Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Doug Van Dyke. I'm the director and general manager for our federal civilian, AWS Federal Civilian and Nonprofit Verticals. Um, who else got goosebumps? Who was upstairs in the room, saw the Blue Origin video, and just had goosebumps? I mean, extraterrestrial settlements. Uh, we, have, we have come so far. This is pretty exciting. Well, uh, I have a few, before I introduce uh, our distinguished speakers, um, I've got a few housekeeping items. So just as a note, please turn your cell phones on mute. We are, and if you haven't, so we're doing this uh, digitally. It is the future. So we're going to take um, your feedback digitally. If you haven't already, please download the 2018 uh, AWS Public Sector Summit app from the App Store and share your feedback digitally. Uh, we're trying this for the first time. We're excited about it, and hopefully it works. Um, also, the sessions you see, uh, the one upstairs will, was recorded and will be available. This one is being recorded and will be available after the event as well. Um, and I, it's, it's my pleasure. I, I get to be the master of ceremonies for this breakout today, and pretty excited to hear from Digital Globe. So. Getting started, data boulders from space, how Digital Globe uses Amazon Web Services to manage data. So please welcome on stage from Digital Globe, Pierre Izard, the Senior Director of Content Strategy and Operations, and Nate Ricklin, the Director of Platform Engineering. Thank you both. Thanks for the intro. Production quality up here is fantastic. If you whisper, if you talk about us, they're gonna pick it up, they'll probably publish it, so um, be careful. Um, we've got about 45 minutes here to give you a quick survey of, of what Digital Globe's been up to in, in AWS, and uh, wanted to double click on um, a bunch of segments of our architecture. Um, boulders from space has nothing to do with extraterrestrial settlements. Um, this is a uh, metaphor we use to really describe what we do with our satellites to users. We dump boulders of data on them, and traditionally, uh, big data environments are lots of little pieces of data, and this metaphor was developed by one of our architects in our Radiant group to describe the process of taking large, compact files um, off satellites into your screen or your mobile applications or whatever, and, and, and boulders is really a, a description of what, what we get from our satellites, and we have to chop them up and make, help our users make sense of it. So that's really just our little internal metaphor. Um, the key priorities for this presentation is really to help you guys better uh, navigate um, what we're doing in our architecture and better understand what, what we've been doing with AWS and uh, helping our users take advantage of some of the capabilities we're bringing to the mission. Um, the um, the breakout really is focused on um, three segments. So our, our space segment um, is, a, is an environment, and Nate will talk a bunch about it, um, where we are doing a, a lot of cloud modernization, re-architecting our infrastructure there in systems that are traditionally on-prem. Uh, our maps segment is really focused on large bulk processing jobs of data, really automating the process of mapping the world uh, at scale. When you've got these boulders from space, you really got to think through how you're going to go about mapping the world, not just imaging it. And then in our access segment, which, which Nate will also talk about, um, is really setting up the, the environment to be much more interactive and iterative in nature as users want to discover what they can do with the data, uh, setting up uh, environments that engage them and allow them to very quickly iterate with the environment. So um, if there's one key takeaway um, here today is, is really the nature of the engagement we have with our users and our partners, Amazon being one of them, um, is really uh, the collaboration that we're engaging with. We've had a long history of working with the public sector uh, over the past 20 plus years. Um, and what you're seeing here is really the product of rapid iterations and innovations, uh, trying to bring more value to the mission, more velocity to the mission, or to the business models uh, that our partners are trying to, to deploy. It's, not a, it's really not a tech push story. It's really uh, the product of, a, of an interactive process um, with our down, downstream customers and our internal engineers as well. Um, so uh, Nate and I, which I should have introduced right up front, um, are going to kind of walk you through more the, the, the what and why. That's what I'll cover. And he'll really get into the how of the architecture and how we're setting all this environment up. 
Uh, we'll bookend this with a little bit of a customer story um, as well uh, to kind of get you some uh, a, a kind of uh, upfront feel for uh, how it is all this is, is helping um, our users. So before we go any further, uh, this talk was titled Digital Globe. Um, who's heard here of Maxar Technologies? Um, 10, 20, 20%, 20 okay. So it's important to uh, highlight right up front that Digital Globe is a, is a business unit within Maxar, which is a broader corporation uh, that's really at the nexus of what, what we uh, ascertain to be the new space economy. Um, we have four companies uh, that are really vertically integrated. This all happened last year. Digital Globe bringing its expertise uh, to the partnership here. Um, but Maxar is really how we interact with our users now at a, at a scale um, that reaches anything from satellite manufacturing all the way to really end user map delivery and information delivery. So a little bit more on that and the public sector here in a bit. Um, I think that logo is pretty cool, uh, inspirational. Maxar altogether is about 5,000 employees to give you a sense of the scale. Um, big enough to, to do large complex solutions, but small enough to really iterate and innovate together. Um, a little bit of a double click on the specialties uh, of the Maxar group of companies uh, or of business units, really. Um, SSL, uh, Space Systems L'Oreal, once upon a time, uh, MDA, Digital Globe and Radiant Solution are really uh, focused on their swim lanes and their specialties, all of them uh, migrating in a variety of different uh, processes and, and, and uh, cadences to the cloud. Um, to deliver more velocity, more flexibility to their users. So SSL on the left, and we'll double click a little bit on, on the key solutions some of these folks are doing. But SSL is really our, our satellite manufacturing uh, group out in Palo Alto, California. MDA is a group out in Canada, been a long time established company doing space and system development uh, within Canada for a variety of mission sets uh, and a lot of uh, system delivery uh, at customer sites as well, customers that are trying to interact with satellites. Uh, MDA has been a longtime partner of Digital Globe. Uh, it only made sense to, uh, to bring those teams together. Um, Digital Globe, which we'll spend a lot more time on the rest of this hour, uh, is really about uh, satellite operations, optimizations, and turning that data that comes off these satellites into value for users. And that's really what we're going to spend the bulk of our time on. Um, Radiant Solutions is a very innovative, uh, deeply embedded uh, team doing uh, advanced uh, geospatial solutions for the US DOD primarily, but also applying those technologies into commercial areas as well. So delivering a lot of agility and interacting really face-to-face -face with end users to make sure that uh, the last mile delivers what, what was intended. Um, so Radiant, double-clicking on Radiant a little bit, going to SSL, MDA, and then Digital Globe. So, a couple examples of what we're doing in the public sector um, with Radiant. So on the top right is a very um, neat application that has been uh, built by a group of ours at Radiant who's had a long, long, long uh, heritage of doing large scale change mapping around the globe. They leverage open data. This is a team that's not leveraging today um, digital globe high resolution data, but in, uh, continuously doing more and more of that. Uh, and leveraging uh, open data sets, leveraging Amazon's infrastructure as well uh, to deliver uh, rapid change information about what's going on, on the surface of the Earth. So if you're out there trying to update your map and figuring out what's going on where and what country, uh, these guys have you covered and can really dynamically give you a sense of how, how consistent, how persistent, how dynamic the change is on the surface of the Earth. Very cool stuff. This is really delivering that last mile of information to the users. Um, another. Uh, side product very related is uh, this capability called Mer Urchin, leveraging volunteer geographic mapping uh, and this change detection capability uh, to allow users to rapidly update their roadmaps. So uh, instead of going and tracing any random place on the earth and figuring out where the roads are and where the bridges are, um, you can actually be directed by a change map um, of where that change was detected by satellites, and then humans or other algorithms can go then and trace the update. So you can have a rapidly, dynamically updating uh, vector map uh, of the world. All this as well, leveraging Amazon architectures and volunteers to help enhance the algorithms. Um, Radiant's doing incredibly cool stuff there. Can't talk about most of it, but there's some really cool stuff that comes out. Um, SSL is a, a well-established advanced satellite manufacturing group. Um, focused on geospatial uh, or geosynchronous orbit technologies for a long time in the communication space, 
but increasingly doing low Earth orbiting missions. So uh, they've partnered with Digital Globe um, to, to build our next generation constellation, which is Legion. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, MDA is our partner up north, um, double clicking on a couple of their uh, public sector uh, investments and, and focus areas. Uh, they've built the Radar Sat Continuity Mission, uh, building a satellite constellation that's going to deliver a bunch of data to the infrastructure, um, looking at uh, mapping locations in Arctic zones, uh, land, land areas as well, uh, and also a change detection opportunity there. Um, also focusing on maritime domain specialization. So, so Canada's got a, a large territorial water uh, zone that needs to be consistently mapped and updated. So they've built infrastructures to, um, to res help responders uh, identify either threats or risks or environmental activities that are going on out there. Um, so a little bit more about Digital Globe. Didn't want to spend too much time up front, but it's, it helps give you some context about what Maxar is up to and, and how we're interacting with our, with our partners. So Digital Globe is really the, the business unit uh, focused on the earth imaging uh, in the optical sense and has been migrating its infrastructure uh, both in the, in the ground segment and in the data segment to Amazon. Uh, we went big on Amazon a couple years ago, and what we wanted to, you, to do here today is really give you a sense of how we've partnered with public sector company or public sector groups and our architecture to, to elaborate and build a, a higher velocity pipeline for, for new capabilities. Um, so we've been working with the public sector, if you look back, since 1994. Uh, we were the first uh, recipient of a uh, commercial remote sensing license uh, to actually spin out defense technologies into commercial applications. Uh, so if you go all the way back, our innovation with the public sector was quite a bit, uh, quite a bit into the past. Um, about two-thirds of our business today, uh, though we don't report that out at the public level, is um, a digital globe focus on public sector. So whether it's, it's civil uh, sector applications or defense sector applications, this gives you a general sense of how important that sector is to our business in terms of focusing on technology and maturation. Um, every public sector customer is out there on a different migration path to the cloud, right? Some are, some are established in an on-prem system and very selectively migrating to the cloud. Some are replicating clouds. Uh, some are building interactive clouds and uh, collaborative clouds between their infrastructure. So uh, key foot stomp here is we can't impose our infrastructure on uh, downstream customers who are still trying to figure out exactly how to manage the two. So um, a lot of investment in understanding the interfaces and the relationships and the privacy requirements and the security requirements that our cloud and the downrange clouds have to, uh, have to orchestrate to. Um, a lot, of go a lot going on in civil mapping and land use in the developing world. Um, depending on the survey, and about 20 to 30 percent of the tax base is actually known and located. So a lot, of, a lot of investment is going into civil mapping and land mapping. Imagery is a key piece of that. And these countries don't have time to wait for a traditional way to map their surface. So they're looking to accelerate that and really hopping right into cloud technologies to make that mapping happen at scale. So Really exciting stuff going on there. We'll talk about it in a second. Um, partnered with defense organizations around the world, uh, friendly to the US government, obviously, since we're a US company. Um, a lot of work going on there. And of course, um, a long history, almost 20 years now, of partnering with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency on uh, their modernization and their delivery to the mission as well. Um, so domestically, double-clicking on some of these key solutions um, I mentioned, I mentioned NGA, and they have a lot of downstream customers across the DOD, IC, and civil. Um, on the top right is an interface we have uh, running data and hosting data uh, in a web environment uh, to deliver not only imagery, uh, but analytic capabilities to the end users and the product of those analytic capabilities to the end user on the screen or in an API. So the customer can rapidly interact with a historical stack of data uh, interface with that and act on it, either manipulate it or actually extract information from it or run engines that, that Nate will talk about in a second against that data to accelerate uh, how quickly they can get to an answer. Um, and the bottom right is a partner of ours in Terra who's doing um, very innovative stuff in the AWS cloud as well, uh, taking that satellite data but also but applying it to the public safety sector. Um, very quickly mapping fires. We have a big fire uh, risk challenge right now in the western U.S. and using our sensor data and the cloud to direct resources more effectively to end users. So where we don't specialize into that end user delivery, we have partners that do that and they understand 
fire operations and fire response much better than we ever would, uh, but they're harnessing our cloud and their cloud to make that happen for the end users in the civil space. Uh, internationally, uh, a lot of similar um, applications, it parallels very well. Um, I mentioned land mapping, uh, a lot of work going on right now to automate uh, parcel boundary extractions and land use uh, information about the surface of the earth. So uh, these, these countries, either in Africa, Asia, um, Latin America, are looking to these infrastructures to really leapfrog um, their information needs uh, rather than acquiring data and infrastructure and software and expertise they're coming to us and asking us to really just crunch on the data and lay out new information for them. We'll talk more about that in a second. Um, on the lower, lower right is a, is a defense tailored product called SecureWatch. It's an interface very similar to the one you saw for the US government, uh, but it allows our defense partners uh, internationally to interact with our platforms in the cloud as well, uh, get imagery, analytics, other data, upload their data and interact with the system as well in order to drive better insights at scale. So, here in this domain, we're highlighting the beginning of what, what Nate will talk about is, is large bulk mapping situations where a lot of data needs to be put up against a lot of compute to extract that nugget of information from those data boulders. In the lower right, you're seeing a much more interactive pattern where an analyst will log in and interact with a system and little by little get to the answer that they need. So two very important patterns for us as you look at the, at the system itself. Uh, recognizing, of course, that a lot of defense customers are and perhaps will always be in their on-prem environment, whether it's a cloud that's, that's updated or a cloud that's um, got a barbed wire again, around it, um, they are going to want to interact with our cloud. So uh, setting up interaction patterns between our systems and their systems is really important. Um, things that get a lot of us, probably most of us, excited about some of the things we do our development organizations. They kind of sit at the hybrid of private and public sector, um, but they have urgent missions, um, important priorities, budgets that don't necessarily scale with the challenges that they're being um, asked to go uh, uh, address. So they'll come to us with things like, hey, I need to count all the buildings in Tanzania in the next month. Um, if you think about that, A, Five years ago, that question would have gotten you kicked out of the building. Um, at Digital Globe, just roll up our sleeves and try to get it done as quickly as possible and try to fit it into the, into the quality specs and into the timeline specs and into the budget specs uh, that the audience requires. Um, so we can tailor a lot of things that way, and that's really the flexibility the cloud has, has given us. Um, huge opportunity for leapfrogging. These, these global development organizations don't have IT infrastructure. There's no switching costs there. They just want the answer quickly. So really cool to be part of those projects. Um, in the lower right, we're working also very closely with Amazon and their open data program. Uh, Joe is running around in here. If you're interested in the open data program that Amazon is, is coordinating, go there. A lot of great uh, uh, curated data sets that are pre-staged for you to go consume. Some of our data goes there as well uh, to help uh, with these sorts of missions. Mentioned Tanzania, I'll go quickly through that and then hand it off to Nate. So that's the question that one of our, our partners has came to us with and said, hey, I've got, a, I've got some resources to deploy in Tanzania, but I wanna do it smartly. I don't wanna do it politically. I don't wanna do it, it with a geographic bias. I wanna do it statistically. So um, instead of telling them we gotta send them terabytes of geospatial data, we stage it on the cloud and allow them to uh, specify what kind of extraction they want against the data, and then they just receive those nuggets of data instead of these big boulders of data. So uh, there are, 18, well, we believe there are about 18,588,000 structures in Tanzania. Uh, that was all produced with a lot of imagery, um, about a million square kilometers uh, of area in Tanzania, a lot of overlapping imagery to make sure we have decent coverage. Um, millions of buildings extracted, all that turned around in three weeks. So if you're thinking about uh, deploying uh, resources in Tanzania, um, we can turn that around for you custom or we can pull it off the shelf and, and stage it for you. Um, obviously, quality and accuracy uh, is something we have to pay attention to. The satellite imagery is a key ingredient in that, but obviously the algorithms are as well. So we try to hone in on, on that quality metric as much as possible. Um, really cool. So on the left is really the, gray, uh, the green outlines are all the imagery that made up the coverage of Tanzania. Um, the pretty map in the middle is what that looks like as a, a tonally balanced mosaic. And the 
black dots there all represent uh, outlines of buildings in Tanzania. And where you see white areas, it's where our imagery did not identify structure or our algorithms didn't identify structures. They probably correlate with national parks and, and rural zones. Um, here's a different look at that. And here are the boundaries. So if you go in there, you'll find that 10% error rate. Uh, but it only took three weeks is really the point. So you can iterate on that and make that better and better. Um, very powerful technology. And again, the users don't have to buy imagery. They just plug into the data feed. I'll hand it off to you, Nate. There you go. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for being here. Same talk, you don't have to clap. <laughs> so Pierre gave you the, the what, what are we doing, who are some of our customers in the, in the public sector. Um, I'm gonna kind of double click into the how, um, and I'm sort of dividing up our, our engineering and our infrastructure into three main groups, space, maps, and access. And I'll kind of go through each one, kind of tell you what it is, uh, what's the driving force behind us getting ourselves into AWS, um, any challenges we've had along the way, and kind of where we are along that process as well. Space, we have satellites in space. It's really cool. Um, but there's more, you know, we have a, not a problem, an opportunity. Um, our, our capacity is gonna grow in order of magnitude in the next few years. We're launching um, Worldview Legion, a new constellation. Other constellations coming online in the next couple of years. We're gonna have an order of magnitude more data. We're gonna have way higher frequency of data coming down. So think every 20, 30 minutes over some spot of the earth, we get new data. Um, orders of magnitude more data of, of these boulders coming down that Pierre was talking about. So what that means is that we need scale and we need speed to be able to pull insight out of that stuff as fast as it actually comes down. So obviously that's driving us into AWS to get the elastic scale, uh, to get the speed of processing. So you know, where are we in that process right now? We've uh, rebuilt our ground segment over the last few years to be uh, completely cloud native. Let me, let me dive a little bit into what that ground segment is just to give you guys a picture because I'm, I'm breaking this into space, maps, and then access. So this is the system that schedules our satellites, controls our satellites, um, co coordinates with other ground systems of our, of our partners and our other deployments around the world that maybe have bought time on our satellites, pulls the data down, um, and then does really basic processing and archiving of that data. So kind of, kind of straightforward stuff that you have to do. So we've rebuilt much of this over the last um, three, four years or so in a cloud native way. And we are very slowly phasing out our, our uh, legacy system with 15 year old monolithic architecture. Um, and it's happening slowly. This is a big mission critical system. It takes a while. Uh, we drove all of our data to AWS. We literally drove it on a truck on the first Amazon snowmobile back a year and a half ago. I don't know if you guys saw it drive onto the main stage to cool music, but that was really cool. That was our data sitting on that truck that we drove to Amazon, and we now have it in multiple regions backed up. Our new data is all flowing to Amazon. Um, so basically, we're all in. Uh, let, me, let me give you a kind of an overview of that. Um, real basic architecture, I won't go into a lot of details, but data coming down from space to our satellite dish here, coming into our in the cloud, um, ground system. Uh, we've got these little rapid access systems. Rapid access is a product that we sell to other governments out there. It's kind of like a ground system light, and it's all in AWS. So this thing talks to our ground system and coordinates with our scheduling and all that stuff, and then the data flows uh, to that customer instead of to our own um, data center, if, if that's the agreement we have. But the, the thing I really want to talk about here, the really cool part is this fire hose coming out of our ground system into S3. That's it. Um, we do the most basic processing to level 1B in, in satellite world. Um, that's the processing level of the imagery that's kind of the most common currency that most downstream things can use. We process it to that level, and we dump it in S3, full stop. S3 is our interface. I think that's the, the really important concept here in this architecture, that Everybody, all, all the pieces in this whole diagram, their whole job is to dump stuff into S3. And yeah, we have some smart stuff happening. Um, we have uh, life cycling to Glacier and back, and we're doing some really cool machine learning and predictive analytics to figure out what's hot, what should we stage into 
S3 versus being in Glacier. Um, but this S3 is the interface for everything downstream to, uh, to use. And, and it's awesome because we didn't invent the interface. Amazon did, and there's tons of documentation out there. There's all kinds of authorization, everything we need. So we just go as native as we can, use S3. That's our interface for everything else. Okay, intermission. Space is cool, and this is a cool picture from space. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't remember exactly how we threw this in there, but I looked at it, and this is Patagonia. That's Fitzroy and Saratori there. Sometimes we just like to aim our satellites way up and figure out what climbing conditions like are like uh, for, for potential future trips, but cool picture from space. Maps. All right, so what this is, as Pierre mentioned, um, kind of bulk processing, bulk um, transaction for pushing tons of data to a lot of our big customers. Uh, and really, in, in a, from an engineering perspective, this is our own people, our own engineers, our own operators, using our own infrastructure to produce product. And we need to do that at scale. Um, so what's, what's driving us to, to need that scale is customers are demanding bigger and bigger things, like this whole continent of Australia mosaic. Uh, each one of those little green rectangles is a digital globe strip, which is typically a 2,000 square kilometer, 30 gigabyte thing that will blow up your Mac if you try to look at it. Uh, so it's hard to deal with. So, you know, when they demand, when when there's demand for these giant things, we need the the scale of AWS and the the ease and the ease of use of uh, of having like EC2 next to S3 and no data transfer costs to scale out and produce things, these kind of things super fast. Uh, customers are also demanding more flexibility in what they get. Um, what we used to do is kind of make these mosaics, put them on the shelf, and that's what we have for the next year or two, and we sell that. Well, with being in the cloud, we now have the opportunity to make custom mosaics on the fly from recipes for people. Maybe you want uh, only certain seasonality, maybe you want um, only you know, a certain year or different time series or things like that. So uh, that's, all, that's all built um, and super scalable. Um, challenges here, there's not, this, a lot of this is our R&D group building this stuff. And the way they operate, since this is kind of manually massaged uh, infrastructure getting operated and building these kind of big bulk products, um, they can go cloud native on the next thing they build. And so that's what they've done. Um, we've had some pretty good success with our, with our R&D team um, inventing new ways of building these things in the cloud, doing it their own way, and then pushing right back into S3 where nobody has to know anything else about that system. It's just S3's the interface yet again. So here's kind of the architecture on that one. Um, this time space is off the screen to the left, it's off the picture. All we care about is that there's data sitting in S3. We've got our entire archive. Um, we've got a bunch of mosaics. We've got a hot cache. We're going back and forth to Glacier and all that stuff. Now, it turns out when you have all your data sitting in S3 and you need uh, you know, people in your own company or even externals, external partners to use it, you need all kinds of stuff on top of it. Um, there's, there's all kinds of licensing restrictions on the data. Different customers are allowed to use different things, different countries things like that, so we have to put in place on top, on top of S3 kind of, a, kind of an access control layer. And again, we've had good luck um, going as native as we can to AWS using tags, using IAM roles, that kind of thing, um, using S3 server access logs to track what people are doing. And then over here on the right, this is, our, this is, this is one example of, a, of our bulk mapping generation. Um, systems. This is Flame. This is our flexible large area mosaic engine. And this team has gotten into the nitty gritty with Amazon. They basically use every service. I think there's supposed to be even step functions on here in batch that they've started using. So they can make any mosaic, um, like you saw on the last page, turn through it super fast, push it back into S3, <clears throat> and now that's available for further downstream processing, pulling out building footprints, doing any other cool stuff with it. All right, finally, access. 
So space, we, we have our IT, our, our ground system infrastructure. We're migrating that to the cloud very slowly. Maps, um, we're, we're operating our own infrastructure to produce product. Access is all about opening up our data to other people. Um, this is other third parties. This is partners. And the reason is because we are super dumb. <laughs> not that dumb, but mostly dumb. Um, we are certainly not the smartest people in the world at coming up with algorithms to run on satellite imagery. We can certainly do a lot, but we're never going to figure out it all. So our strategy here is really to build an ecosystem, a place where producers can come, algorithm, produce algorithm generators, um, two, two people in a garage and a dog with an idea and an algorithm can come play against our imagery, figure out cool stuff and plug it into our pipeline and we can go to market with it and sell it with our team of salespeople. That's kind of the idea here. So what you're looking at on this slide is GBDX notebooks, which we announced at reInvent last year um, on the main stage. And it just went GA a couple weeks ago, so this is fully open and available. Um, you can go sign up, get free access to data, um, some data, not all of it, and learn about you know, what, how to access it, um, run some cool machine learning against it, see what other people have done, tweak their code, make your own thing, run it at scale, all that kind of stuff. This is, this is our attempt at enabling an ecosystem to come play on our data so that we don't have to do it all. A little bit of what, what this looks like architecturally from a, from a big picture is this time in the middle is our S3 cache, all of our content. On the left, we have third party stuff coming in. It's not just our own data. Um, we're pointing at Landsat data, you know, Sentinel, all the stuff that's already in S3, but other third parties, we have to capture their data somehow, pull it in, uh, normalize it, all that stuff, and that flows in again to our S3 cache interface right in the middle. And then <clears throat> on top of S3, if you're gonna open up your data to third parties, to, to just random internet people to come and, and get your data, you gotta have a service layer, and you gotta stop people from scraping all of it and stealing it all, right? So we have um, our RDA system, which stands for Raster Data Access. This is our service layer on top of, of, of uh, S3. It has some optimized random access stored of data. It's totally elastically scalable. And this is what gives you random access to pixels. Any pixels, any way you want them. That's our system, and that's what's powering, <clears throat> excuse me, GBDX notebooks. So I don't know if I have to click here, but this, at this point, this is kind of a, do I have a mouse? I don't know. Could someone over there click on the arrow, maybe? <laughs> this is kind of a teaser. Um, I'm talking on Thursday morning, um, more specifically about Machine learning on satellite imagery integrated with SageMaker, streaming in your browser. This is the head explode moment. But what you're looking at here is our RDA system integrated with SageMaker, um, Amazon's machine learning inference service and training service. And basically, we're viewing the output of uh, a building footprint segmentation inference model on the fly as we drag the map around and pan around and, and uh, it all happens in real time on the way to the browser. It's super cool stuff. So if you want to learn more about this stuff, what we're doing with this, uh, with SageMaker and with real-time machine learning, come to the talk next Thursday. A little bit more eye candy. Um, we can find airplanes on the fly. I don't know if we can, we have, we have time to click here. I'll just kind of keep going. Yeah, airplane detection on the fly as you pan the map around, super cool stuff. And then we've even tried to get super fancy <clears throat> and run two different SageMaker models at the same time in parallel and do diffs and stuff on them. So, you know, this particular example, the red blobs are new buildings that were not in the 20, 2008 image, but they are in the 2016 image. And this is streaming to your browser on the fly as you kind of map around. Again, super cool stuff. So this is all part of of an ecosystem of tools, uh, a whole suite of tools that we are building to enable access to our data um, and to try to build an ecosystem of players who will advance the state of the art of AI against satellite imagery together. That's what this access piece is all about. 
Um, if I could give lessons learned on that, you know, the, the teams that build the, uh, the access pieces, we've got, we've got great ex-startup people who are super proficient in AWS, been doing AWS their whole career. So building the stuff is easy. The hard part is really integrating with our legacy systems, integrating <clears throat> with our ground system that's moving at a bit of a slower cadence. So that's kind of the, the, the main lessons learned up here at the top is these different components of our infrastructure, different also groups in our engineering organization, all sort of move at a different cadence. Um, there's, a, there's a cultural piece to that. You know, part of it is, is learning AWS and, and in our kind of old school aerospace waterfall way of doing things, being willing to experiment, play with what's out there. But it doesn't, you know, it's, it's hard because you can't just replace a legacy system with something new when it's this mission critical thing. So it's not something you can do fast. So the, the trick here is find a way for these different moving teams, these different speeds of, of teams to work together. Um, and on the cultural piece, one thing that Amazon did for us that, that I just want to call out that was really cool is they came and did a game day hackathon at our company. And so I imagine this is something they can do for anybody who asks. Basically, they show up, put on a hackathon for you. You send a bunch of developers, have 100 people in a room, and you do Amazon's hackathon. It's an awesome way for different people in the company to kind of mix and match and learn about AWS together and trying try to figure things out. Um, I participated, this was like three weeks ago, and learned a few more things about AWS. So it's, it's cool for everybody. So definitely do that. And then the biggest, the biggest lesson learned, I think, in working on Amazon is don't reinvent the wheel. Amazon's coming out with managed services and they have a bunch of them lying around. Don't rebuild that from scratch. Don't build like a, a set of nodes that are all gonna be load balanced and serve your web app. Amazon does that for you, you know? Uh, and the other, the other main thing that, that I learned or that I, I think my observation is, is whatever you're planning on building in Amazon, anywhere really, halfway through, your, uh, halfway through building it, Amazon will come out with something that if you had it at the beginning would make you only take half the time to build the thing you're trying to build. So I don't know what the lesson there is. Certainly we can't <laughs> wait around and hope Amazon's gonna do stuff for us, but we should always be curious, always be paying attention to what they're doing always be trying things out. Not everything they come out with is awesome right away. Sometimes it takes a year to bake and then, every, then it's robust, right, unfortunately. But a great thing to do there is like what we've done is we've partnered really tightly with, with uh, AWS. Um, we have great dialogue about features and what's coming out when and we get to influence the roadmap a little bit and that's been awesome and we've enjoyed that, giving us the confidence to, to dive in on some of the services when we're, we're learning about them and they're, and they're new, like SageMaker. So with that, I'll hand it off to Pierre. Thanks, sir. Um, we have time for Q&A as well after that. Um, we want to give you a quick roll up, really, of, of what we've been up to in Amazon. Um, hopefully this was informative uh, with regard to focus on public sector applications, the interactive patterns we're having within, within our own teams. We have different architectures that are all on different migration paths. Um, depending on where they were born. <laughs> and, uh, and obviously, um, getting into the open kimono, really, on, on, the, on the technology itself and how we're migrating our system to take advantage of Amazon selectively uh, based on the, the best use cases. Um, Q&A after this, but we don't want to part without um, talking about our customers and what, we're, what they're doing. So tomorrow is World Refugee Day. Um, when we set this up, we didn't really know how political refugees were going to become over the past week. But um, tomorrow is Refugee Day, nonetheless. Um, and what we are doing with the uh, USA for a UNHCR um, organization, Stanford University, uh, really flexing the entire stack we talked about here, um, is helping map and characterize the world's refugee populations with a high degree of fidelity. So it's an area that is, that is um, starved for uh, hard, reliable uh, information, independently verifiable information. Uh, so what we're doing in this campaign is, is using volunteers you can go to the tomnod.com platform, which is uh, an environment uh, for us to uh, solicit inputs about what's going on in our imagery. Um, we've partnered with Stanford. 
um, and their artificial intelligence lab to uh, identify and, and using the crowd, uh, refine algorithms to better detect refugee structures, structures within refugee, refugee zones and characterize what's going on, whether it's administrative buildings, tents, permanent or semi-permanent structures, uh, and helping uh, UNHCR through this USA for AIDS UNHCR organization uh, better appropriate uh, resource, or allocate resources, distribute resources, um, and use quantitative methods really to um, address uh, the refugee problem around the world. So we launched this campaign, I think it was Friday, it was blogged about and tweeted about, it's ongoing now. You can go to tomnod.com, sign up, have your kids sign up, and start finding uh, these locations in the imagery. And over time, that, that results in a better map um, and a faster map for everybody. So uh, that's the call to action for you. Um, we have, is that a countdown clock? Yeah, it is. 12 minutes for Q&A, so we have a little bit of time. Um, who would like to start, whether it's more on the technical side or on the strategy side, customer side? Yeah. So the question was um, really a cost comparison between our on-premise system and the cloud system um, and the decisions that were made. So cost was a factor, uh, certainly, in making decisions. So where, where cost um, made sense, we migrated to the cloud more quickly. Snowmobile is an example of that. Uh, the snowmobile is a copy of our entire archive that it was more effective for us to store in the cloud, even in a cost-effective way. Um, though it was a slower access pattern, it made sense for us economically to go there because not only did it uh, obviate the needs for us to have an on-prem infrastructure, it also uh, allowed us to unlock access to that, to that archive for new business patterns as well. So there was a cost element, but it was also a flexibility element uh, to balance that out. And that, that is being done very really deliberately and thoughtfully across the entire architecture. It's not black and white. Uh, it's also, again, a, a customer partnership as well. We don't want to do things that are going to break how our customers interact with us. So it's a complicated answer. Cost was one. Flexibility was one. I think what Nate talked about in his lessons learned was important as well. There's, there's so much infrastructure is a very different thing than it used to be, right? Infrastructure has code and has software and it has tools and techniques in there too. So there was also a dimension of efficiency uh, that had to do with that. So cost, flexibility, efficiency, probably the three key variables as well, and our customers are there. A lot of our customers are moving there too, so it only makes sense for, uh, for us to be uh, where the bulk of our customers are. Hello. Oh, we, are. we have a few more back there where the light is shining. Yep. Is there a non button? Okay. Yep. Um, hi. Uh, I saw you the first diagram, uh, just a uh, request for clarification on it. I saw that um, you had satellite data coming down to a receiving station feeding directly into the cloud. Do you also have um, the satellite uh, command and control um, systems? Did you move those into the cloud? And if you did, do you have any lessons learned? From that? I, that, is, that is a journey we are embarking on, I would say. Um, they are architected for the cloud. We don't want to move there um, too quickly. It is it's an area where you don't want to change the wheels while the car is in flight. Um, but, but that's something we're exploring. It's just, it's just really a customer story primarily and a priority story right now. So our, our commanding right now is not in a public cloud environment, no. Uh, yep, there's a hand raised, sir. Yeah. Yes, do you have any near real time requirements and failover and resiliency requirements on any of the data sets that you deal with? On the data sets, yeah, so we have a resiliency requirement for sure. Uh, we use multi-region uh, capabilities there to ensure that the data isn't in only one high-risk location. Um, so we have, we have a lot of redundancy built into that as well. And real-time access, S3 has given that to us and we're replicating that capability as well. So in terms of data access patterns, yes, we have requirements that are regulatory requirements. We have our own internal business requirements as well. Um, we we sure. do have timelines of uh, data coming off the satellite and getting in front of customer eyeballs as fast as possible, and there are SLAs around that. And you know, there is the, the push to the cloud takes a little bit of time, 
but the scale in processing things in parallel um, gives you, you know, makes up for that, that time to actually upload something to the cloud. Is that a fair answer? Do you want to? Nope. Good. Cool. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, really cool stuff. Uh, uh, thanks a lot for a great presentation. Um, <clears throat> you were uh, you were talking about uh, a, 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 a number of various applications, uh, counting buildings, uh, and I imagine. And this question has to do with uh, sort of the downstream potential. Mm -hmm. So. Um, how are you? How are you selecting those those application, the industries that you're going into, um, and I guess how are you supporting uh, companies? Uh, are, are are you helping to select the areas of focus? Because it just seems like it's like the wild west potential, sure. and you can go in a million different directions. How do you narrow that down and make those decisions? for narrowing down the, 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 the market potential or the down market potential specifically. Yeah. If um, you get that. Great, great product question. Um, I think we, you know, we were really born as a, as a horizontal product in the sense that we, we provide you know, high grade, I'll call it military grade geospatial content, um, which provides a degree of, of assurance and, and consistency um, to the users. and. Um, our early customers were defense customers, um, so we are, we're certainly deep there, and, and our Radian team is, is really foremost there in terms of being integrated with defense customers. So our customers from a business, you know, practical business perspective have, have pulled us in those directions just because of where we were uh, born, quote unquote. Um, and then being very selective in, in our partnerships as well. So we, we don't want to build something that's gonna disrupt 50 startups that had a similar idea, we'd rather enable them to go do that um, where it makes sense to uh, go more vertically and partner with them in a, in a joint development sense, then we would go do that as well. Um, but I would say that to, to a large degree, we, we want to understand the use cases. We want to enable our, our platform to streamline those use cases. But you know, by and large, aside from the defense sector, you know, because our Radiant team is really at the edge there, um, I would say we're, we're largely a horizontal enabler there. So if you're, if you're an integrator or a big data company or a, an analytics company, um, we'd rather be in the business of making you successful than you know, disrupting your, your value chain. Um, I think that's a, that's a generalization. Um, may get a slightly different answer, but I think by and large that's, that's probably the right one. Did that answer your, your question? Well, No, no, we, yeah, we are, we are helping to identify those segments and those markets. Um, I'll kind of defer and say we've got a really great product and go-to-market team who is forecasting and identifying these things. And one of the ones we decided to go after was building footprints. So we've been nurturing a, a customer who's been in the Wild West ecosystem for a while. We've nurtured them, um, given them bigger and bigger projects and pilots and things like that. And now we've got a partnership to produce building footprints over the whole world and sell those as a base layer, right? They're gonna be on the shelf, and there's some strategy there. There's not just we can go sell these footprints to people, but they're a base layer to be used in many other things that we and ecosystem producers can play with. So we are, we are helping identify those markets, and then we are kind of calling for algorithm producers that are out there to come help us do these things. Yeah, yeah and I would, uh, you're, you're witnessing a, how dynamic the ecosystem is right now, right? We're both describing a product in a different way. I think. Building footprints can mean different things to many verticals, right? We want to enable building footprints for somebody who has that IP, but how an oil and gas or an insurance or a fire response company is going to go monetize that, you know, is, is going to evolve, right? So it's, we're, 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 we're in that testing mode. And again, that's another testimony to how flexible the infrastructure allows us to be, right? We can, we can decide how to monetize that and how to go to market with that. I think I've got the mic and I'm on. Um, Hopefully I didn't yeah, contradict thanks, Nate there. Thanks again for a nice presentation. Uh, I wondered, given the sort of origin of uh, the technology you have from the military sector, whether you're subject to any export regulation for any of the data you have. So we, for example, ITAR, EAR, um, yep. and if you could say a little bit about how you deal with sort of data access policies for if you have regulate, subject to export regulation or anything. Yeah. Like that. Um, 
we, we are regulated by the Department of Commerce. Um, we have export controls on our technology. Um, we're, we're partnered with the Department of Commerce to iterate on that. It's a very dynamic space. So government's been a, a partner in that journey as well. So it's not a, you know, it's not a one, one-sided answer. So we, you know, whether it's capabilities we could build and launch and making sure we have the regulatory environment to do that is, is one dimension. Another one is existing ones and, and ensuring that we have uh, the right degrees of freedom with, with how we can go market that mindful of the fact, of course, that we don't want to, you know, impact any other sensitivities. So, yeah, regulation. Um, we also want to be smart uh, business, um, you know, business players as well. So we, we want to be, we want to be right at that, at that cusp of innovation, but also uh, obviously complying with regulatory oversights. Yeah, data like ITAR, anything ITAR is not in the ecosystem. And actually, we do our best not to even push it into the cloud. We keep that stuff on-prem and only push out what we can because we just don't want to deal with building all the infrastructure around it, even if we could. Right. Yeah. Yep. No, we don't use GloveCloud, not for this. Yeah. Last, question. Last question. Okay, great presentation. Thank you. I saw in your diagram that you have some data going to S3 and some data going to Glacier. So what kind of data goes to S3 and what goes to Glacier? And um, what's the typical size of your data and what's your typical monthly cost for storage? Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> talk to that guy. <laughs> so yeah, we won't talk about cost, but um, um, you want to talk about storage and orchestration a little bit? Yeah, so we push out raw 1D data strips into S3 and those lifecycle the glacier. And it's really easy for somebody, if they want it internally, to say, cool, pop that one out of glacier for me, I'm gonna access it and do stuff with it, and it'll lifecycle back, that's really great. What we do for the real-time streaming stuff is we keep a cache of the entire archive compressed um, somewhat, and it's, there's like a 10 to one size difference there, and that gives us real-time access to everything, and this is for when access and real-time availability is more important than you know, perfect data fidelity, for which it's probably good enough for most everything anyway. But if you really want perfect data fidelity, you gotta wait longer, pull stuff out of, S out of Glacier, get it into S3, and then do your processing downstream from there. And as far as cost, we've got- One zillion. Yeah, yeah so one, one image strip is 30 gigabytes. It's, it's shaped like that. <laughs> I don't know why this is a helpful thing to, to show you. Um, it's a big flat <laughs> boulder from space. Yeah, so we actually store them in a cloud-optimized way um, for our cache. Uh, we have our own internal format, but cloud-optimized GeoTIFF works just fine. There are a few other things out there. I know there's talk of analysis-ready data coming out of Radiant Earth. Um, anything anything cloud-optimized, basically where you can get random access to different geographic chunks, is great. And then our systems can pull out the chunk, do some processing, and serve it to you. The, uh, after this talk, Go back to the video. These guys next door at Element 84 are doing some great stuff with a, the with a NASA data as well. So you know, take our word for it, but then also take their word for it. They're really doing some cool stuff too. So NASA data sets are also in the cloud and available there, and there's, there's a handful of ways to do this for sure. I don't know what their price is for storage in the cloud. <laughs> I hope it's less than ours or more than ours to the taxpayer. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Can we have yeah. a uh, big thank you for Nate and Pierre? So right now we have a 10 minute break. We're going to be starting at 2.55. The next session in this room is Black Sky Advancing the Geospatial Revolution.